Now, I do want to introduce uh, our next speaker, Matthew Riley, and kind of in the, same, in the same vein, I've got the script side of what I'm going to say here, but I've also got the personal side. And uh, personally, I've known Matthew for a very long time in this community. Uh, when I first joined, he was one of the very highly active people, especially on the .NET side of things. And, um, you know, really, you will not find a kinder, more mentor-driven person in the community. I, I personally believe that. He's awesome. Um, he's incredibly dedicated. I have no doubt he'll get into some of his background with running, uh, which when you get to hear that, it's just, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a whole thing. Um, okay, so I, 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 I'm, very, I'm very thrilled to get to announce Matthew Riley here. So, script side. Uh, introducing Matthew Riley, a tech enthusiast and Oklahoma tech community stalwart with over 20 years of experience. He's deeply passionate about DevOps and observability. Hence the title, I'm sure. Today, Matthew will be your guide into the world of data-driven cultures through observability. Learn how to empower your teams, boost operational efficiency, and foster a culture that treasures data as a crucial asset. Matthew will share real-world examples and practical tips to help you jumpstart your organization's journey toward becoming more data-driven and observable. Don't miss this chance to lead your business in the data-driven era with Matthew's insight. Let's all give a big round of applause for Matthew. Alrighty. And I could say the same nice things about you. Aaron here has been in the community for many years, doing a better job than I ever did. So let's see if we can get everything set back up. And let's get started. So, first of all, I want you guys to realize that I am not a presenter. Um, this is very uncomfortable for me, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, I do, I am very, very passionate about observability and hopefully that comes through in this talk here. Um, so we're going to be talking about building a data-driven culture with observability. I'm Matthew Riley and yes, I will tell you a little bit about my running career next. Oops, one second. So who is Matthew Riley? Well, as you already heard, I work at Heartland. I'm a senior director of software development. I manage all of our internal application teams. And I've been around the Oklahoma City area my whole professional career in about year 23. I've worked at many different companies here in the company, well, in Oklahoma City over the last 23 years. I was one of the founding members of Techlahoma. Uh, I also started OKC Sharp uh, several, several years ago. And like Aaron said, I used to be really heavily involved in the community, but since about 2018, I've kind of stepped back and focused more on my career, more than technology in the community. Um, I am a semi-retired ultra runner, so this is one of the things that I'm probably one of the most proud of besides my technology career. Um, this is me in one of my favorite races that I did. This is Badwater 135. It's a 135 mile race across Death Valley. It took me about 33 hours the first time to complete, and it took me 32 hours the second time. I wish my technology career was just as good as my running career, but you know, you get what you get. My ultra running career doesn't pay very much, so here we are. I have a loving family. You can see down here on the bottom, that's my wife, Cammie, my son, Christian, my daughter, Alice, and my two little fur babies. We got these little poodles, brownie, and sugar. So. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to tell you what is observability. I'm gonna go down to the basics, kind of tell you about the pillars of what they are. I'm gonna demonstrate troubleshooting using observability. I'm gonna dive even more into why I'm passionate about observability. And then, of course, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Heartland's journey into observability and then what's next for us at Heartland. So first off, what it, when I say observability, what do people think? Can somebody give me a definition of observability? That's a good one, yeah. Somebody said logs? Yes, sir. That's, yep, that's it as well. I like to think of it as my superpower, right? It's my superpower because I can instantly gain insights into my applications and infrastructure. I can know how things are running in the cloud. It gives me the ability to understand how my applications are performing in the wild. 
it's like x-ray vision into my application. It truly is. Like before we had observability, a lot of this was just debugging and guesswork. So let's go on to a more technical definition. I'm not going to read this out to you. You can read it. This is from Wikipedia. But at the end of the day, observability is a collection of different tools that give you the insights into your applications. Those include metrics, logs, tracing, and profiling. And so somebody said monitoring, which is kind of right. So when we talk about monitoring and observability, what is the difference? Well, monitoring is a process of gathering data to understand what is going on inside your application. It's the what. Observability takes you to the next level using that same data and adding a little bit more, and it lets you answer the why, right? Why is your system misbehaving? That's very powerful. Think of it as monitoring 2.0. You can also think of monitoring and observability as an iceberg. Monitoring would be what you see at the tip of the iceberg. Underneath, that's where all the stuff is going on. That's what observability brings to the table. It lets you see the whole picture. There are three pillars for observability. That's logs, metrics, and traces. There's a lot more to observability, but these are the three core fundamentals. So let's talk a little bit about each. First, we've got logs. Logs are a collective of information about what your system is doing at any given point in time. They're like breadcrumbs. You can track down errors or you know, web access, all kinds of stuff that, in, that happens within the logs. Next, we have metrics. They're basically data points with a timestamp. And then we have traces. Traces tell you what's going on in your system. You can think of a trace as an application calling a database. The trace is not only the call to the database, but the time that it took to get there and the information that was passed along. So once you have all three of these pillars, you can create pretty little dashboards like this. So this is a Datadog dashboard. Sorry, I moved away from the mic. And this is also the tool of choice for Heartland. We've consolidated down to Datadog. And so in here, you can see metrics, traces, and logs. There's a lot going on, and hopefully I'll be able to break down some of this during this talk. So what is a log? Again, it's a computer-generated file with information regarding the usage of a system. Here's a pretty good example of what a log aggregation tool can do for you. So you've got all these logs and you want to look at them. Log aggregation tools or observability tools can parse those logs into different data points and allow you to search uh, the data a lot easier. So over here you can see there's multiple hosts, multiple services, all reporting into logs in this aggregation tool. So why do we collect logs? Well, there are many reasons and one of them is compliance. Not the favorite reason here, but a lot of us have regulatory reasons why we have to hold on to logs. Sometimes we've got to hold on to logs for 10 years. If you've got to do it, you've got to do it. There's no getting around it. Insight, that's my favorite, because you can gain insights by inspecting your logs. You can know what type of errors are occurring in your system. You can know who's using your system. You know, the, the uses go on and on. And then security. Sometimes you're going to get audited, and you're going to have to produce those logs to prove your system's you know, we're up and running and doing what they were supposed to do. Many reasons, like I said, here's some more practical uses for logs. My favorite is troubleshooting, right? By looking at logs, you can get an idea of what's going on in your system. Almost all troubleshooting sessions start with logs. Monitoring, and by monitoring, I mean monitoring your logs. So looking at your logs as they come in and setting up monitors. Once you have those monitors set, you can put actionable alerts. Let's say you're getting logs with a whole bunch of errors, right? You can alert on that so that you know your customers might be experiencing problems. You can also use them for auditing, like we talked about earlier. Personal history. So if you've ever been down a rabbit hole and can't remember what the heck you were doing, logs can come to the rescue. You can retrace your steps. And my favorite is not getting in trouble. For that time that somebody deleted those VMs in production, I can go to the logs and I can prove it wasn't me. <laughs> now, what kind of services generate logs? Well, a better question would be, what kind of services don't generate logs? 
Nowadays, almost everything generates logs from containers to serverless functions, browsers, et cetera. You name it, if it's in the cloud or running, it's probably producing a log. Well, now that we have all these logs, what the heck do we do with them? Well, hopefully you can, cons you can consolidate them and use some type of observability tool or log aggregation. Again, here's another example of what Datadog can do for your logs. Again, our tool of choice. So you can produce these logs. When these logs come into the system, you can enrich those logs, which means you can add additional data or metadata to them. You can also view the logs in a live tail in most of these systems. That means as the logs are coming in in real time, you can view what's coming in. You can generate metrics off your logs, like how many errors you're getting, et cetera. And then you can retain these logs with indexes. And this is where the power comes in, because if you retain your logs with indexes, you can also correlate all your trace information, which we'll talk about here in a minute, with your logs, and that becomes powerful troubleshooting. The one downside about retaining all your logs with indexes is it's very costly. So one of the most costly things, um, in my opinion, in observability is log storage. So you need to be pretty cautious about what you're storing, um, at least in real-time searching capability. Now, on the other side, you have archive. You can always send your logs to some type of uh, storage bucket and then rehydrate as, as needed. That's a lot cheaper cost for storing your logs. All right, so what is a metric? Like we kind of already said, it's basically a number with a timestamp. Here is an example of some sexy metrics, not very exciting by their own, and they don't have a lot of value uh, with just a couple of them. You really need to see metrics over time, right? So once we start collecting these metrics, we can start to know what's normal and what's not. Um, as time progresses, again, yeah, we can tell what, what is and what's not. As you can see right here, we have a spike. And this spike could mean an issue with our application. It could mean something's going crazy in our, in our network. It could be a bad deployment. Without knowing what's normal and collecting these metrics, it's really hard to tell. So why do we collect metrics? It gives us a baseline for operations. And what I mean by this, it lets us know what is normal and what is not. If you collect your metrics over time, you can tell that your application is usually using 80% CPU utilization and know that that's not an abnormality. Without tracking these metrics, you have no idea what is normal and you don't know when is it a fire drill and when it's not. Reactive responses. So without metrics, you don't have a way to easily tell if an application is online. And proactive responses, why wait for something to go wrong? By looking at metrics, we can get ahead of problems before they happen, right? And that's where it's really powerful, to be able to look at your metrics and tell that something's about to happen and fix it before your customers complain or find out about it. That's always the goal, right? We don't want our customers to tell us we have issues. We want to be the ones that find it first. So why do metrics matter? Well, if you're collecting them and you know what's normal, you're gonna wake up for less calls. You're gonna spend less money because you can do just-in-time provisioning for your infrastructure by monitoring your usage. Less fire drills, less support tickets, and a happier boss. That's one of my favorites, but my very favorite is, again, happier customers. By less outages because you're tracking your metrics, you're gonna have happier customers. So what is a trace? This is the last pillar. And a trace is used to track the time spent in an application, processing a request along with the execution path. So what does that actually mean? Well, this is a trace. And there is a lot going on there, I get it. I need to explain another um, term here real quick so this can make a little bit of sense. And that is, what is a span? So instead of giving you a boring definition, I'm gonna to try to explain this in a scenario. So let's say that a trace is me going on my lunch break. This is me. This is a younger version of me, actually. But I still think I look the same. And I'm going and getting a cup of coffee on my lunch break. And then I'm gonna get a cheeseburger because I love a good cheeseburger. Well, you're probably asking yourself, what in the world is this guy talking about? How does this have anything to do with traces or spans? Well, let's pretend that this lunch break is a trace then these individual steps would be the span. You can think of a span as the individual unit of work being done by your code, 
all throughout the trace. So technically a span is an individual unit of work of code doing its job. This is what separates, tracing is what separates monitoring from observability. So taking a look again at this trace, you can see at the top, that's our parent span. This is a web cart doing a checkout process. And underneath are all the child spans, all the other, unit individual, all the other units of work being done with the one request. At the bottom, you can see the metadata that is associated with the span, and that can be highly valuable to anybody trying to debug or trace an application in production. So why do we collect traces? Well, I think observability came around and became super popular because of microservices. Now we've got all these tiny little services sending information all over the place, and if you don't have observability, it's really hard to tell where things fail. Right? You've got one service calling another service, calling another service, calling a database. How do you track where that transaction fails, right? Observability and tracing really helps out. Optimization. By using tracing, you can see how long each individual call, each individual unit of work is telling or is taking, and you can come back and optimize that piece of code. So let's say you've got a, a web request that looks like it's running for many, many, many seconds. You don't know why but you can use a trace to come back and see that it's down at the database la layer. Maybe you need to optimize the query. Troubleshooting, that's probably my favorite. Traces, along with its counterpart logs, are unstoppable when it comes to troubleshooting. You can tie them two together, those two together when you use an observability platform. All right, demo time. Everybody take a minute, pray to the demo gods that this is gonna work. Please, Lord, oh Lord. Here we go. So, what I have is a demo web application, and I'm going to attempt to show you how I can debug this and fix this using Datadog and observability. So let's go look at my web application. Oh my God! This does not look like what I would be expecting, huh? Let me see if I can't figure this out. So here's my handy dandy tool, Datadog. First, let me show you something else that we get from tracing. So tracing allows you to do really cool things like service maps. The internet is not the fastest here today and I am hot spotting off of my phone currently, so I apologize. Well, this is, while this is rendering, what it's gonna do is basically show you, well, it, or it's not, uh, it can show you a service map of how your application is connected and which the communication paths are. Uh -huh. Let me double check something real quick. I'm up and running. Behind the curtain. Okay, okay, okay. All right, well, that is what it is. So let's go see if we can actually fix what these issues are. So I'm going to take a look at these traces that are coming in. And we can see that we've got traces coming in from our application. Let's see what kind of errors we're getting. Well, this one here looks pretty suspicious to me. It's in my advertisement service. So if I click on this, I'm going to get some details. And you can immediately see this flame graph that's showing all of my, uh, trace, my, my trace and my spans. And at the very bottom, I'm guessing this is where it's originating. So I'm going to click on it. If I look down here, here's some of the metadata that came along with that trace, and the message is telling me that it looks like there's a division by zero. Who the heck would divide by zero, right? Let's check the errors. Well, if I come down here, well, heck, it's telling me that there's this divide by zero error, and it's actually giving me the line number in the file that I should probably go look at. So I just so happen to have that file open for us. And here we go, might be a little hard to see, but somebody put a divide by zero error in there. Silly, silly guy. So if I fix it by just remarking it out, because that's how good developers do it, let's go back to our site and again pray. Oh, look at that, we fixed the problem. And that's good. So let's take a look some more at this site. I can go through here, I can add something to my cart. Whoa. Oh my goodness, now we got another error. 
Well, let's go back and see if we can't figure this one out. Let's see, this one looks pretty suspicious. And if I go to the error here in this span, here we can see, if I can move this up a little bit, that there is a undefined method. Hmm, what is this little thing over here? Well, I've actually got my source control system tied into my observability platform, so why don't I go see what code file relates to this? So this is where stuff gets super, super powerful, right? Now I'm in GitHub, here's that code file that we're just talking about, let's see if there was any recent changes. Well, this one looks pretty suspicious. Who the heck would check in something with break stuff, right? So if I come here, yep, here's that fool, he put in that divide by zero up top, and at the bottom he put this little code snippet in the wrong file. Well, let's see, let's go back to our code, see if we can verify this finding. Well, there's that freaking line there right there. Let's take that out. And that's how easy it is to troubleshoot your applications, right? In minutes. I wish it was that easy sometimes, but you kind of get the gist, right? That's the power of observability. It gives you these breadcrumbs to come through, look and see where errors are coming in and help give you really good ideas of where to go look. We had that source code integration that showed us the file that it was in and we could tie it to a commit. That, that is why I love this stuff, because it's freaking amazing, in my opinion. All right, let's start talking about some of the commercial offerings. All right, so this is Gardner's Magic Quadrant. Everybody should, well, everybody probably knows what this is already. It's a very established uh, company that evaluates all the different offerings out, out in the wild. This one's on observability, and our leaders are Dynatrace, Datadog, New Relic, Splunk, and I even put App Dynamics on there. I've personally used Datadog, New Relic, Splunk, and App Dynamics. They're all pretty similar, I would say. They compete on some feature functionality, additional things like that code integration that I showed with Datadog. Um, but for the most part, they're really similar. And I'm going to show you a way here in a second where you can basically instrument your code one time and try out all these different vendors. All right. Let's talk a little bit about what the open source environment looks like. So just like the commercial offerings we just talked about, there's also open source platforms out there. Some of them aren't fully uh, observability platform, but they do cover at least one or two of the pillars. You've got Prometheus, which is a popular monitoring tool and database. You got Jaeger, which is a tracing platform and ops trace here. They tout themselves as a full observability platform that also does data observability. Um, there is open telemetry. This one is my favorite and we're gonna talk a little bit about it some more. It is not a platform, but it is APIs and SDKs that allow you to instrument your code and send to multiple vendors who have adopted the ultimate open telemetry format. So a little bit of a rabbit hole. Most of the players in the observability space are accept open telemetry data. This means you can instrument, instrument your application one time and send to multiple vendors. This helps prevent vendor lock-in because again, you can instrument your code one time and just point it to wherever you want. It's super powerful. These are some of the vendors that support open telemetry. So even Datadog, the one we use at Heartland does, and almost all the major players. So again, if you're, wanting, if you're not into observability yet and you're wanting to get into observability, I would highly recommend you start with open telemetry and get a feel for what it can do. They've got a demo out there that I'm fixing to, sh fixing to show you. It's super easy to get spun up on your local machine. It takes three steps. And once you get it up and running, you can also have it try out different vendor offerings. And so once again, we're gonna pray to the demo gods. Everybody praying? Oh, you know what? The demo gods are not gonna like us because Matthew Riley did not practice his script very well. So, Behind the curtains, 
uh, this demo, I'm running the third step that we just saw on the screen, and that's actually building and deploying the application. Uh, this is running all of those applications that come with that demo into containers locally in Docker. And so it should take just a second to start coming up. Has anybody played with OpenTelemetry? Yeah, what do you think? Fantastic. What, what are you visualizing it in? Grafana. There's lots of offerings out there. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is the actual demo. So this is the site it comes with. There's a shopping cart. There is a really cool feature flag service. So this service here will allow you to play with different errors in your environment. So you can toggle on, toggle on and off, right? And so if you're wanting to observe multiple observability platforms, this is a great tool because you can go see how you can try to diagnose in multiple tools. So what I really wanted to show you is how I'm sending metrics to multiple tools from one instrumentation of an application or applications. And so this is Jaeger. This is one of those open source tools we had shown or I talked about earlier. It's receiving trace data. It's going to be able to do those service maps like I tried to show in Datadog earlier. It just didn't work for me. And you can also monitor even the metrics right in this tool. Another powerful tool is Grafana. And we're just now, since I just started, just now starting to collect the metrics. But again, sending metrics to multiple platforms with one instrumentation of our code. And here's, that serv here's a service map in Datadog. So again, I am sending that same open telemetry data. I went into that demo and instrumented it to send it to Datadog, to my instance, and I'm able to get all the tracing, metrics, logs, et cetera. And I'm going to show you how simple it is. So here's the tracing data coming in. And this is the config file. It might be a little hard to see. All I had to do was come in here and add an entry for Datadog. This is my key. It's a trial, so it's OK if you steal it. It's only good for another day. And then down here, I say export my logs, my metrics, and my pipelines to Datadog. That's all I had to do, just a couple lines to this configuration file, and I'm sending the same metrics that this demo is sending to my instance of Datadog. That is super powerful, guys. Like, if you think about it, if you're, monitor, or if you're evaluating multiple offerings, like you want to see if New Relic's better, if you want to see if Datadog's new, better, you can use this and send it to all of them at once, getting the same data, data to compare you know, the, the offerings back between each other. So, another reason why. I'm just a nerd. I love these things. All right. How about we kill this demo? What do you think? Oh, I guess I could type two. All right. So why am I passionate about observability? Well, I've been around for a while. Uh, I know I don't look it, but I've been around since Y2K. Uh, that's when I started my software career. I actually drove to Oklahoma uh, on January 1st of 2000 and started my first day as a software developer on the second day of January 2000. Uh, back then, things were a lot different. Um, I didn't have monitoring tools. Uh, wasn't a lot of logging going on. And so troubleshooting issues were really difficult. I love to say this because people find it, I'm sure there's older people in here as well, or older than I am, but back in the day, we didn't even have source control, right? We used to zip up our code and store it on a shared drive somewhere. Uh, if somebody needed to update it, they would get the zip file, unzip it, update it, and reverse the process. So a lot of things have changed. 
when I was a fledgling young junior developer, I had to troubleshoot and support our beta installations of our software. And so our software back in that day was banking software that was installed in various banks. And to get access to that, I had to use a dial-up modem, right? So if you remember plugging your laptop into a modem, I would dial into their gateway, which would then patch me into one of their servers, and I would try to troubleshoot on a telephone line. And if you've ever done that, you know how painful that is. You've got the refresh rate, which is not great. You're watching the screen repaint as you're trying to find those logs and solve your customers' issues. It was very stressful, and it caused me a lot of anxiety. To this day, I actually carried a pager, a physical pager. If I hear a pager, anything sounds like a pager. I don't know if you guys can relate, but I get like a panic attack. Oh my God, I hate that sound. So anyway, from that very beginning, I knew that I had to do a better, or I, ne I needed to find something better for debugging my applications. So the one thing that I could do back then was log the heck out of everything. And so I started logging everything from that point on so that I could leave myself and my future self breadcrumbs to figure out what the heck I had just done in production. So, so let's fast forward many years. Uh, this is around 2018. Um, I'm leaving We Go Look. So I worked at We Go Look for a little bit and We Go Look had a cloud native architecture. They were using a lot of cool fancy tools uh, and we had just as many cool fancy tools to try to help us monitor uh, and observe those applications. The problem was is it wasn't centralized and it took domain experts to really know how to come in and troubleshoot these applications. It was a mess. Uh, and without heroics and again, experts, we really struggled. So at that time, I was on my way to CoreLogic and I used the month or two that I had to really kind of dig in and do a lot of reading. I wanted to figure out if there was a better way of supporting infrastructure and applications in the wild. So I read a couple books. I started with the Phoenix Project Really great fictional book. I don't know if you, if you haven't read it. I guarantee if you read it, you can relate with almost every character in this book. That led me to the DevOps handbook. So I read the DevOps handbook, and then I read it again, and then I read it for a third time. This book for me was groundbreaking because it was the first time I felt like I had a blueprint of how I could come in and help run a development shop and do it efficiently. So one of the things they talk about that's relevant to observability is the second way, which is the technical practices of feedback, right? How to create telemetry and enable seeing and solving problems, an analyzed telemetry to better anticipate problems and achieve goals, and enable feedback to develop and so that development and operations can deploy safely. That's a key feature right there, right? Being able to deploy and not be afraid. I don't know if you're like me, but I, most of the companies I work in, they're, everybody's afraid to push that deploy button, right? Because you never know what's going to happen. Having observability can really help give you that security blanket. So I joined CoreLogic in 2018. I'll try to speed it up here a little bit, I think. I'm running. Am I running? No, I'm running. Okay. Sorry. Talking to myself, too. Bad habit. So I started at CoreLogic, and one of the tools I had used before is New Relic. It's an observability platform as well. It's a very easy one to get up and running. It's an agent-based. So basically, I've been in .NET most of my careers, and so most of my applications have ran on Windows servers using IIS, et cetera. And so this is very simple. You just install the agent on all your servers where your applications are deployed, and it can auto-detect and start tracing those applications. So this was groundbreaking for the business unit that I was in because that business unit had been around for about 25 years. They've had 25 years worth of code running in the wild. And if you asked some of them, they couldn't tell you if they were actually being used or not. So by putting in observability, we could instantly tell which applications were being used. And for the first time in the history of that company, we could actually react to issues happening in production before they hit our customers because we had that telemetry data and we had those monitors and alerts. But about a year into my career, 
there at CoreLogic, uh, there became a larger initiative to put observability, to standardize an observability across the entire enterprise. CoreLogic is a merger and acquisition company, which means they acquire the heck out of companies. And so for each one of those business units that they acquire, they want to try to standardize and centralize how they support these applications. And they chose to go with the Elastic Stack, which was made by Elastic. It's an open source tool that does observability very well. So being the nerd that I am, I love to do the proof of concepts and play around with these type of things. I stood up a cluster for our business unit and started monitoring these applications. I fell so much in love with observability and this tooling that I accepted a job as Director of Site Reliability Engineering for CoreLogic. And in that role, it was part of my job to instrument uh, elastic and observability throughout all of our business units. Uh, with that, we were able to consolidate down to one platform and bring on business units using Infrastructure as Code, or IAC, we were able to actually spin up their uh, observability platforms within their applications in a matter of minutes, where it was, used to take hours or days or months even. And by doing that, as the acquiring company, we had instant, instant knowing of what actually we were getting into, right? We could see visually what all was running in the wild. We could know the debt and all the tech debt, et cetera, that we were bringing on. So to do this, like I said, we leveraged Elastic for our observability. We had Uptrends, if anybody's used that, it's a synthetic monitoring tool to monitor our infrastructure and applications. We used PagerDuty to alert, and then we found a tool provided by PagerDuty, which is called RunDeck. What RunDeck is, is it's an automation tool. It allows you, it will answer PagerDuty alerts, and if you have automation scripts to run in case of those alerts, it will run those for your applications and your infrastructures, thereby healing your infrastructure and solving your problems without needing manual intervention. Very powerful tool. And we also used it to page our SREs. And together, they managed our infrastructure. So what is a data-driven culture? I'm gonna go through this really fast. Here's a really good definition. Um, I also worked for a uh, local company here called Interworks that does Tableau consulting, so I'm a very big fan of Tableau. And here's a definition that they provided. We got any Anybody from Interworks here? Eh, too busy making money, I guess. All right. <laughs> Great company. I have nothing but respect for that company. So why build a culture that is data-driven? You can have sustainable improvement, faster decisions, greater transparency, unabridged market research, optimized spend, and organizational consistency. Basically, data makes decision-making a lot easier, and you have the data to back it up. There have been several companies that have used observability to help leapfrog uh, in their journey. DICE is one of those. Here's a little blurb about what they did when they were putting out Battlefield Five. Out of water. Lenovo, they were able to speed up their MTTR by 83%. That's mean time to restore. That means they were able to get their systems back up and running whenever there was an instant, 83% faster. They maintained 100% uptime despite a 300% increase in web traffic on Black Friday. That's the power of, of observability, knowing what your infrastructure and your applications are doing and being able to react before there are issues. So what is so powerful about a data-driven culture with observability? Well, for one, you can intelligently decide what applications need attention. You can know what your customers are thinking or what they're experiencing. You can understand which applications are seeing the most traffic and which applications aren't being seen at all. You can experiment in real time and get instant feedback with your applications. And one of the really cool things I like is you can compare one release to another and see how it performs or if you've introduced any new issues with your past release. So are you doing harm with your latest releases? 
So Heartland's observability journey. Well, we're in the middle of our journey right now. Um, it started kind of back in 2021. And in 2021, I wasn't there yet, but I'm told that we were using many different tools. So we were using App Dynamics, Application Insights, Sentry, and Datadog. And around that same time, one of my good buddies, Forrest Humphrey, he took over our cloud engineering department, and along with him, he brought James Wasson. Uh, James Wasson is probably the most talented data dog uh, and SRE that I've ever met. And together, they formed Heartland's first site reliability engineering program. And their goal is to fix things before our customers let us know about them. That's a pretty dang good goal. So where is Heartland today? We've consolidated on Datadog. So instead of using all these different tools, we're using Datadog for all of our tracing, logging, and metrics. This has made us way more efficient when supporting all the different business units that we have. Uh, Heartland and our parent company, Global, are kind of similar to CoreLogic as we acquire lots of companies. And as you acquire companies, it's really hard to support them unless you have some type of observability platform that you can standardize on and know how to troubleshoot. Um, we've had several different success stories during our career or during their short, I guess, short career on this. Um, many different business units have brought problems to the DIS department and they were able to solve them in minutes where they were struggling for hours. So these tools are super, super, super helpful. Um, we're, st we're still learning. So one of the things that's kind of funny is you know, these tools are expensive as well, and if you turn something on, sometimes you can incur a pretty good cost. Uh, so we had turned on sensitive data scanner in our environment and started data scanning all of our data. After one day, our uh, rep called us up and asked if, if we had meant to turn it on because we had racked up a $10,000 bill. We did not want to keep that on, and so we've got a really good partnership with Datadog. They did not charge us for that, but could you imagine if they would have been a bad vendor and we let that thing keep running? We could have got several hundred thousand dollars pretty easily. Uh, so when we're talking about onboarding new business units, we do these in five different stages. Stage one is we onboard all of the applications, so anything that that business unit has, we try to instrument it with Datadog. Then we bring the developers in to start learning Datadog and how to leverage it. And then we tie in monitors and alerts to the NOP and we provide them playbooks so that we can have a centralized incident management. Next, we work with product development to define error budgets, SLOs and SLIs. If you don't know what that is, that's um, been popularized by site reliability engineering, so service level objectives and service level, I always get stuck on this one, service level, um, yep, I'll look it up later. And after we do that, we build in automation resolution of incidents where possible. So you notice a couple of them are in green, a couple of them are red, that's because we're still in the middle of our journey. We fully realized the first three and we're working on the last two. So where are we today? We're ingesting about 25 million logs an hour. We're collecting about 3,000 metric points. We're indexing about half a million spans every hour. We've got about 700 hosts we're monitoring, 300 services that are instrumented with tracing and APM. We've got over 200 monitors that are keeping uh, eyes on our infrastructure. We've got 125 integrations, so these are different technology integrations within our observability platform that helps us enrich that data. And we've even started with those SLOs, all within one tool. So what's next for Heartland? That's where I come in. I'm trying to level up, level up the internal applications department that I run. So I'll tell you a little bit about that department. Uh, we are 11 teams. We've got about 120 team members. They're in the US, India, China, and Latin America. We've got 200 plus applications running mainly in data centers, not gonna lie. And a few little things in some clouds. We're currently 
monitoring, uh, we're not doing very well at observability. And so what we do have is we have Datadog infrastructure monitoring that provides us basically metrics on how our infrastructure is behaving, CPU utilization, et cetera. We've got custom application metrics that we instrumented ourselves. And we've got way too many alerts. So one thing to be cautious about when you're going out there and you're creating monitors is you really want to make sure that they're actionable. Because if you're like where we're at today, I get about 100 emails that I just ignore because it's just way too much noise and nobody's kept up with these monitors. We have minimal log aggregation. So we are logging to files somewhere. And then we have another tool called Sentry IO. I'm starting to like this tool. We primarily use it for error monitoring, but it offers some of the same functionality that Datadog does as well. We're just not leveraging it yet. And most of our logging, like in CoreLogic, is going to Microsoft SQL Server tables. And the issue that I have with this is it requires domain knowledge to know which table holds which application's logs, and then it also requires access a lot of time to get to those logs. So it can become really hard to troubleshoot or centralize troubleshooting if, you ha if you're keeping them in multiple locations. So here's my plan. I'm gonna further invest in Datadog by adding application performance monitoring, log aggregation for all those logs, all those SQL, everything that's going to SQL now, I'm gonna to send to Datadog. Synthetics for real-time monitoring of APIs and systems. I'm gonna leverage real user monitoring. I'm gonna audit our current monitors and reduce the noise. So back to how we got alert fatigue right now. We're gonna make sure that all of our monitors are alerting on actionable things. Implement paging for critical issues, so put people on call. And I'm currently staffing two teams right now, and these teams consist of pro production stability, cloud engineers, and SREs. They're responsible for configuring and managing our Datadog instance, writing and maintaining infrastructure as code to provision observability. They're gonna help set up an internal NOC and incident management. And the primary goal of this whole plan is to make reliability internal apps a number one feature. Now I'm running short on time, but I was gonna to explain to you what RUM and Synthetics was as well. RUM is real-time user monitoring. It allows you to basically capture your user sessions and play them back in real time. So it's a screen recording of what your users are doing in your system. It can be super powerful if you're using it to capture when your users run into errors. Imagine your user, you can see your users navigating your website, what they click on, and then capture that error that they're experiencing. That's what RUM can do. Synthetics, that is a way to test your code from an observability platform. You can give it an, out, an, an endpoint and a payload and inspect the responses as it comes back, similar to what you could do with like a Postman, except this one will send it out and it can send it out from multiple locations. So most, most of the times when you're using synthetics, you're testing from multiple countries and multiple states all to see if your site is up and behaving as expected. And thank you, Lord, I am done. <laughs> Any questions? So on that note, I'm actually gonna close out the Q&A on this one. If you do have questions, find Matthew Riley here. Um, I wanna make sure we keep our tracks in sync here. So um, we're gonna get back here in this room at 1035. That's about eight minutes, and then we'll get our next talk going here. So thanks again, Matthew. Oh, thank you.